Joining us right now by phone is John Carney from Breitbart News. Good morning to you, John. Good morning, guys. Praise be to God. We're grateful for your time today. Uh, I want to I want to ask you about the OPEC fallout this week. I found that very fascinating. But before I do that, let me get your take on the consumer price index report that came out yesterday. How did you see it? It was much worse than expected. The month to month number was twice what expected. And I think the really interesting thing to me is this is the 11th out of the last 19 uh, months in which Wall Street, the professional economists, all undershot on their predictions so that we had upside surprises. That's not supposed to happen. These guys get paid a lot of money to try to get it right. They've only It's only been under their prediction twice in those 19 months. So this is uh, basically, the entire economics profession unable to accept the idea that inflation is now high and more persistent than they thought it would be. We talked a lot about this yesterday as well, but uh, it's still very fascinating to me. We're we're in a situation where they want to push inflation rates, uh, or it, they want to push those interest rates up to try to contract the economy, but yet we're still spending out of control. Th th this just seems like a recipe for disaster. Some are saying we're headed towards a financial collapse, of it, like, a, like a real fallout of some kind. Others are saying they're, it's not really going to happen. What is your long-term prediction here? 12 months, uh, 24 months from now, what are we looking at? So I, I think we're definitely going to have a recession, a significant one. You know, we had those two quarters of contraction this year. Some people say that was a recession. They have good arguments for that. But I mean a real recession, like we, you know, a recession with a 3.7 percent unemployment rate doesn't feel like a recession. I think next year we're going to have an increase in the unemployment rate. People are going to get worried. We're going to have a significant fall in things like corporate earnings. We're going to have people pull back on spending. So we will feel that. It will feel like a recession. It won't be as bad in the U.S., frankly, as it's going to be in other parts of the world, particularly in Europe. They're, they're worse off. But this is what we're headed for. I can't tell you how long it's going to last. I don't think it's going to be super severe. This isn't. This doesn't look like for now. Uh, it you know it involves a financial crisis or you know the the ruin of many industries. But I do think you know we, we've got to be ready for that coming recession. So you don't see a second Great Depression? No, I don't see a second Great Depression. I but we could cause it, right? Like, policymakers can mess things up. So the Fed could go too far. What you just said is very important. It, it doesn't make sense that we don't have more participation on the fiscal political side in trying to contain inflation, meaning pull back on the spending. The Biden administration seems to just be able to, you know, they announced the student loan forgiveness program, which is equivalent to basically a half trillion dollars of spending. We should be we shouldn't be doing this stuff in a period in which we need to cool off the inflation demand side of the economy. Yet we're still doing it. That puts more pressure on the Fed to raise interest rates even more, which then probably makes the downturn even worse. Now, in looking at this report that came out yesterday or the inflation, the the consumer price index, I mean, it's you might think, well, it's coming down. It's better than the last report. I mean, that's good. But even if it comes down to the number it was a year ago this time, which was 6.2 percent, even that number was incredibly high. So we have a long way to go to get to back to anything that feels normal. Yeah, and I caution about thinking that this was better than prior months. Yes, the headline number was below what it had been but the, for the year to year. But the monthly number was actually up. If you look at other metrics like core inflation, which says, well, you know, ignore the price of gasoline because gasoline dropped in September, but it's going back up. So that's why we ignore the price of gasoline, because it goes up and down too frequently. So if you look past that, that also got worse. If you look at measures like that, I consider good measures of underlying inflation, meaning you know, take ignore the extreme price measures. So there, the Cleveland Fed puts out something called median inflation. That's just like right in the middle of inflation. That also keeps getting worse. 
And so, and, the, and that to me is predictive of where inflation is going, meaning we're not, we haven't really made any progress at bringing it down. And as you said, even if we bring it down just to where we were a year ago, that's a disastrously high rate. The Fed thinks 2% would be appropriate. Some people think it should be even lower than that, but we're nowhere near that, and it's going to take quite a while for us to get there. In your latest article over at Breitbart, uh, you pick up on Jason Furman and you, in, uh, basically saying that we can't really blame Russia for all of this, can we? No, because the things that you could, you know, pin on Russia, which was, you know, the and by the way, it's when we say this, it's really the Russian sanctions because Russia didn't cut off the oil from, from the rest of the world. The rest of the world cut off oil from Russia. When you look at the things that the invasion could have affected, those aren't driving inflation right now. It's actually things that are, you know, well within the, you know, just purely domestic things like health insurance in the U.S. Putin didn't, like, buy all the health insurance, and that's why it's up 28 percent year over year. That's not what's happening. What happened is we have excess demand because we pumped a lot of money in the economy you know, when we were facing the pandemic. And then afterwards, once we already had vaccines and the economy was recovering, the Biden administration did another almost $2 trillion of stimulus that was completely unnecessary. And I think years from now, people will be able to say, you know, once we're past the immediate politics of the day, they'll be like, yes, that was one of the most foolish fiscal policy moves anybody has ever made. But this is clearly a very divisive uh, issue because, according to recent polls, as much as 84 percent of Americans consider the economy and inflation to be the biggest factor going into these midterms, yet it divides very starkly along of uh, uh, political parties here. Republicans are have a different margin than Democrats. Why would there be such a split when the numbers are what they are? It, you know, we've become very politically tribal. And people have trouble looking beyond, is it my side or their side? One thing I will say is there's been movement in some of these polls, which, yes, there is still a wide gap between Republicans and Democrats. But in some of the polls, including one from The Economist and YouGov, we've seen uh, more Democrats coming over to the side of admitting, yes, OK, I do think inflation is a very important issue. We've seen movements in racial groups, so black and white Americans are coming closer together in their views on this. And this week was a very interesting week when it came to the fallout between Saudi Arabia and the United States, the Biden administration in particular. We all remember fondly, was that a couple of months ago, maybe, of the, the famous fist bump between President Biden and uh, the the crown prince there in Saudi Arabia. We and they were he was going to negotiate a deal. Well, now I think we're realizing that deal was kind of political and bipartisan. What say you, John Carney? It was very uh, political, and there the fundamental background here is the Biden administration has done everything to discourage the production of fossil fuels, including oil, in the United States. And yet, they've been demanding that OPEC and Saudi Arabia produce more of it. This makes zero sense. Even if you were the biggest climate change you know, person in the world, it doesn't matter where it's produced. We're not talking about you know, polluting a local river. It's where it's, it's, it's not even where it's burned. It's the fact that it's burned. So it makes no sense that they were going to do this at all. They, they got themselves into this position, got us into this position where we have a shortage of oil. The Saudis are saying, look, the rest of the world is heading into a recession, so we think that will decrease demand for oil, so we're going to decrease the supply. Just like any normal you know, factory would do, you say, I, I, I think people are going to want less of this in the future, so we'll make a little less. The Biden administration didn't like that. They requested that this, this decrease in oil production wait until after the election. And that's what has people outraged, because they say, look, that looks like you were just trying to, you know, not actually fix the problem, but delay it so that Americans wouldn't see what was happening to their economy and to oil prices until after the midterm elections. Mm.
very convenient. Uh, Mr. Carney, this is Rudy Carlos here. And, you know, one of the uh, one of the things that I've seen uh, about the the production of oil here in the United States is some people say that uh, that would destabilize the uh, the price of oil all over the world. Do you think that there's any sort of uh, truth to that? Uh, it, let's say, for example, tomorrow. Biden has a complete change of heart, and he says, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna reinvigorate domestic drilling here in the United, in the United States." Would that really destabilize the oil market of the world? It, so there is a danger whenever you have uh, a product that has a capped amount of uh, demand. You know, there's, we can't we can't can't burn that much oil in the world uh, that you can overproduce. This actually did happen back, uh, of, you know eight years ago, where when shale oil in the United States was really taking off, it was the production was overinvested in. And actually, a lot of these companies lost money. But that's also part of the capitalist system. You, you, you experiment. You see where the market will stand. Maybe the price of oil drops. But OPEC also has a response to that, which is they can decrease their own production or they can increase it to try to drive out some other people totally fine. We could have that. I think we're better off, though, right now when we see the consequences of underinvesting, which is what we've been doing in this for years, of saying, look, let's get out of the way of energy production. Let's let it happen. We don't have, there's, we, we don't have now, and we will not have for a long time, enough renewable energy resources to substitute. So, we, so let's use the oil and not bankrupt ourselves. I, I want to bring in Europe's situation into this conversation as we're talking about energy here. Um, Europe seems to be looking at a very bleak situation right now. They they really haven't been able to increase their alternative energy sources. Wind is not very reliable. Sun doesn't provide enough. And the more the more EV we decide to push ourselves. The, that much more energy is actually needed in a system that can't keep up with it already. They've seen 400 percent growth in energy prices just between January and September. They're in desperate need of energy over there. How do you look at that? That's right. And what they did is for years sort of took the easy way out. Instead of investing in their own energy infrastructure or energy energy production. They can't produce that much, frankly, but they could make it so that they could accept energy from all over the world. They didn't. They decided to rely on very cheap Russian natural gas. And this, we now know, was a foolish move, because if you were going to then sanction Russia, you're not going to probably for very long have a lot of access to Russian natural gas. It's very hard to get liquefied natural gas, which comes from the United States, in ships into Europe because they don't have enough ports that can take those in. You need very specialized equipment to make that happen. And so they've, they've put themselves where this winter, perhaps also even next year as well, uh, they're going to have not enough energy to supply all of their industries and all of their households. There's very a very good likelihood that they may have to shut down factories to keep people warm if the winter is cold enough to you know to just make enough electricity to uh, make houses not be freezing cold. Hope you know we could luck out. Maybe maybe it's an unusually warm winter and Europe doesn't have you know as bad of an energy crisis as we fear. But look, we shouldn't be you know just uh, hoping for a you know, a unusually warm winter uh, in this day and age. We, you know, we we have the technology to supply ourselves with heat. We just they they just really messed up their ability to provide it. But I mean, we have to connect all the dots here. It's also affecting farmers in a time when we're already seeing massive food shortages around the world. I mean, there's talk about uh, Dutch farmers cutting back. Uh, as much as 80 percent on their output just because they can't afford the energy uh, to to produce all those crops. Uh, that's not going to just affect Western uh, culture like Europe or America. It's the third world country that's going to be starving for food and uh, because of all of this, don't you think? Yes. And I will say one of the things we talk about at the Breitbart Business Digest, which is 
our free newsletter. Everybody can sign up for it. The, up on the upper right corner of the website, there's a little bar that says newsletters. Sign up for it. Give us your email, Breitbart Business Digest. You'll get it every night. And what, it, what we've been talking about a lot is that food inflation has a very big effect on people's psyche. Because when, in part because you, you buy food very frequently. And so, you know, unlike you know, when furniture prices go up, you don't, you might not notice it for a year because how often are you buying a, t a new table? Uh, you, but food, you're buying all the time. People all over the world are buying it. And it responds very quickly to inflationary pressures. And we're seeing some of the worst food, the worst food inflation in decades. And it looks like, partly because of the factors you're citing there, that it's going to get worse. And I'm not worried that, you know, we'll run out of food in the United States or in Europe. But as you were saying, there are, there are countries that, that are absolutely dependent on imports for their food. And they are going to have trouble in part because their currencies are falling against the dollar, by paying for and buying enough food to feed their population, which is a very dangerous situation when you have populations starving. You know, mm. it foments revolution, violence, and I think you know. Hopefully, we may, you know. I pray that we're able to avoid this, God willing. But we will. But I, I am not confident that mm -hmm. we will be able to. You know, I saw, I did see a report, and I just confirmed it with one of our uh, one of our loyal fans from uh, Germany right now, that uh, Russia did offer another deal to Germany f to supply them with gas, but Germany turned that down. Are they shooting themselves in the foot there, or is that a smart move to not be dependent upon Russian gas? I think that they need to move away from dependence on Russian gas, especially if they want to treat Putin like a pariah. You, you know, that guy is going to be running the country for the foreseeable future, and you can't have it both ways. Either you learn to make your peace with Putin, or you probably have to take the hard medicine and, you know, you, you made an error by becoming dependent on him. You, you don't double down on your error, you know, turn to a different way. We've also seen the uh, rise in populism across Europe, which is very interesting. Of course, Italy is the most uh, recent one we've been looking at, Hungary, Sweden, other places. Do you see that is going to change things significantly in the coming years? Will that make a big enough impact, or is the European Union just have enough control over everything that not much will change? It will be a hard struggle. Nothing will come easy for the populists of Europe. They're, you know— 40 years of building a establishment infrastructure that is built literally to ignore the will of the people. That's, and that, and it's given rise to the populism, but, but the people running that infrastructure are not going to go quietly into the night just because of a couple votes. <laughs> They're going to do everything they can to undermine the populist uprising in Europe. And so, you know, I, I can't tell you how it ends up, but I can tell you that it will it will not come easy to the populists. Do you think because uh, people are returning back to coal plants, they're turning them back on, they're trying to get them back up. Do you think they'll consider building new nuclear plants? I think that they will consider building new nuclear plants because the because coal you know, is is exactly the opposite of the direction they wanted to go in. And as you said, you can't really power Europe on solar and wind because sometimes it's not sunny and <laughs> often there's not enough wind. You at the very least need a backup. You know, so I live in, I live in the hills in the woods uh, up in New England, and we lose power all the time. So if you're smart, you don't just go into the darkness. You have a generator that you can turn on when you lose power. That's what you're, and the way Europe needs to think about its renewable reliance. Fine, use as much renewables as you can, but make sure you have a plan to supply your country, your continent with power when that's not working. Yeah, yeah, for sure. John Carney, Breitbart News. God bless you. Thank you for your time today. We appreciate your insight. Thank you for having me.
Check him out online at Breitbart.com. Search for John Carney. You'll see all of his articles there. All right, that's going to do it for hour number one. Thank you all for joining us. We appreciated having you on and uh, the conversations we've had. We're going to go into our second hour, and we're going to talk with Dave Palmer about uh, St. Thomas Aquinas on gluttony, on uh, drinking and fornication, all these things, and what St. Thomas Aquinas has to say. Plus, we're going to give out the prize in our Fear and Trembling game show. All that and much more. Go to grnonline.com forward slash cdt to join the conversation.